Welcome to the next part of Module 1, Part 6, Measures of Spread. Here we're going to be looking at what's called the five number summary in box plots. The measure of central tendency uh, gave us a way for us to look at where our data is mostly centered around, whether we measured that with the mean, with the median, or with the mode. Another important information we'd like to know about our data is how is it spread around? Are the numbers spread way apart from each other, or are they somewhat close to each other? First, let's talk about quartiles. If we divided our data into four equally sized groups, we have created four quartiles. You may have also heard of the term percentile. A lot of time percentile is used as a way to divide up a group, a very large group, into a hundred different subgroups, all equally sized. We call those percentiles. If you, for example, take a standardized test, most standardized tests report your result as a percentile and not per se as a percentage. If you'd score, say, in the 85th percentile on the test, that actually means that you're in the 85th group, uh, meaning 85% of the people scored lower than you and 15% of the people scored higher than you. That's the idea of a percentile. A quartile is somewhat similar, except we're doing it in to, s to fewer groups. We put them into four equally sized groups. So we have the first Q1 value, which tells us where <coughs> the first 25% of, of the data fell. We have the Q2 value, which actually shows us where the lower half and the upper half are divided. Then we have the Q3, which shows us the division, or it's the division between the upper 25% and the lower 75%. So the Q2 is actually our median. It is the number or the value or the place that separates the bottom half from the upper half. The other two end up being the median of the lower half and the upper half. So literally, Q1 is simply the median of this half of numbers. And the Q3, the third quartile value, is the median of the upper half. So, in order to find quartiles, we just have to find the median three different times. So the first thing we want to do is actually the second half here. Um, we first want to establish where the second quartile is, or the median is of the half of the set. That means that we're dividing it first in half. Then we find the, the median of the first half of the data, since we've already divided it up by finding the median. Then we find the median of the upper set, and that value is our third quartile. Yeah. As you know, odd and even make a difference in where the median is located. If we have an odd number of values, then after we have found the median of the first half, we do not use that value, which is actually a value of the set, when we find the median of the first half. And we'll see this in an example. If we have an even number of values, then remember what we do is we find the median, or the, I'm sorry, not the median, but the mean of the two values that are in the middle. That value is not an actual value of the set. It's simply uh, the mean of the two values that are in the middle. So we're not going to ever count that uh, since it's not a value of the set. So you'll notice that we are always excluding whatever value is our median when we're finding it. So we always exclude whatever median we have in calculating the mean for the lower half and the upper half. All right, so let's take a couple, let's take a look at a couple sets of data. We're actually going to do data set one first. For this data set, we have 10 values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
That means we have an even set of values. The location of the median is going to be 10 plus 1 divided by 2, which is 5.5. <coughs> so, as we go through here, <coughs> the median is going to be the mean of these two numbers, 47 and 48. So it's 47.5. Whoops, sorry, went a little too far there. So you can see that there's, if you can picture an imaginary line here that's dividing up these two sets of numbers into an upper and a lower half. There's five numbers in each half. So my Q1 is the middle number for the first half, which would be 45. And for the second half, 53 is my uh, Q3. The same th locations of these medians exist for data set number 2. 10 numbers, so the 2 in the middle are 49 and 50, the 5th and the 6th numbers. So we take the average of those two, we get 49.5. <coughs> for the first half, then, Q, uh, 48 is the Q1, and for the second half, 61 is the Q3. Now, just knowing those numbers is really not very helpful. We really need a picture to be able to display uh, how this data is spread out over the real number line. This is called a box plot. Box plots are a convenient way for us to draw a picture that represents the quartiles and hence where our data is spread across the number line. To do this, we use our quartiles and then we throw in two other numbers. Those two numbers that we throw in are the minimum and the maximum numbers of the data set. To construct a box plot, we can determine the five number summary. Then we draw a horizontal axis. The second part here is actually the most important. You want to make sure that the horizontal axis that you draw is not just the five number summary that you found spread out over a number line, but simply a real number line above which we are going to draw the location of the min, the Q1, the Q2, the Q3, and the max. You've got to have a real number summary here in step two. Step three, now we draw the lines above the number line, and we make a box and connect the box to the minimum and maximum with lines. You're going to be able to see this very easily in the next example here. So in my next example, we've got our first data set. Uh, 45, 45.5, and 53. And then we have the minimum and the maximum as well. So, I draw a real number line. Notice that I just spread it out. Each of these are evenly distributed with 10, and then we're going to let the numbers fall where they may. This is the most important part. Without the real number line, your box plot has no real meaning. So we find, <coughs> excuse me, the minimum, 41, the Q1, 45, the Q2, 47.5, 53, my Q3, and then my maximum, which is 66. I make a box out of the ones that are in the middle. So your box actually represents the Q1, the Q2, and your Q3. The two other lines are representing your min and your max. So we connect those with lines. The box represents the middle 50% of your data, and these two represent both individually 25%. So you can see, for example, here that 75% of my data lies below 53, because that's my Q3. We can also see that 50% lies below 47.5. <coughs> what we really like to do with box plots a lot of times is to compare two different sets of data. By doing so, we can see how these two sets of data compare to each other. So for my second one, we throw in the minimum and the maximum, and then we do the same thing. We place the locations of the min, the Q1, the Q2, the Q3, and the max. We connect the three in the middle as a box, and then we connect the lines together. <coughs> so you can see between these two sets of data, 
that the second set of data has a much greater spread than the first. 75% of my data is between 61 and 20, whereas here, the 75% uh, of my data was uh, between 45 and 53, much less of a spread. You can almost picture how this data is contained. Keep in mind that each one of these sections of these um, bars are, represent a quarter of my data. In other words, there's the same amount of data between here and here as there is between these two, meaning that these are really squeezed in together and these are really spread out. In other words, we're just again trying to get a picture of how my data is spread out along the number line. This in conjunction with the median, which tells us where the centermost data value is, can give us an idea of the look of our data without ever having to look at an actual number. <coughs> now another way for us to measure spread is to talk about the interquartile range. <coughs> The interquartile range uh, tells us where the middlemost, uh, sorry, the middlemost 50% of my data is located between. Because a lot of data sets always contain um, extreme values, the largest and smallest don't always give us a good description of the spread of the data because by nature, being the largest and the smallest, they would always be the most extreme values of the data set. It's possible that these values are outliers, and so we can't be too sure how representative they are of the overall set of data. The distance between the quartiles is a more resistant spread. That's because we're not picking the two most extreme values. So the distance between Q1 and Q3 is called my interquartile range, or IQR. In this case, well, in any case, we take Q3 and we subtract Q1. That gives us a number. So in our previous example for data set number one, we would take 53 and subtract 45 from it, which would be 8. If we were to take a range of the entire set of numbers, it was 25. In other words, half of the data is in a range of 8 units, where the entire data set is within a range of 25 units. One of the things that we do with the certain quartile range is to use it to help us identify potential outliers. An outlier could be a piece of data that doesn't really belong in our set of data, either because there was an error made when it was being collected or just because it's so atypical, it needlessly skews the overall picture of the data. I gave the example of zero on an exam because of an absence. That would have a big effect on my overall picture. Sometimes, if that's the case, that zero score, may I may want to leave that out because I consider it not really a part of what I'm trying to look at. I don't, if someone did not take an exam, that zero should not be counted in the average because my goal is to figure out a picture of how people did who actually took the exam. Maybe also we were doing a study of commute times and one of the commuter experienced a flat tire or was in an accident. That would probably give us a uh, very long commute time which wouldn't belong in our overall data set. Or maybe a real estate study of overall home prices in a given area include the prices of home that recently burned to the ground. Do we really want to include those in the price values of homes in a given area? These are all examples of numbers that could end up within a data set, but that really m we might want to leave out. So what we're going to do is we're going to tag certain numbers as possible outliers. Just because a number is large or small doesn't mean that it needs to be excluded, but it is important for us to tag numbers for further investigation. <coughs> so just because we're tagging numbers doesn't mean 
that it's going to be an outlier, but it does give us a way to, a systematic way of tagging numbers. So here's how we do it. We take one and a half times the interquartile range above Q3 or below Q1. So in my previous set of numbers, the interquartile range was 8. So I'm going to multiply 8 by 1.5. That gives us 12. Whoops. So if I add 53 to 12, I get 65. And if I subtract 12 from 45, I get 33. Now our uh, minimum value, if we look at the previous slide, for data set number 2, our minimum value was 41. 33 is way over here. So that means 41 really isn't tagged as a possible outlier. However, uh, 65 was what I got when I added uh, 8 to Q3, which was 61. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong set of numbers here. <laughs> 53 was my Q3, so when I added that, I got... <coughs> um, let's go back to the slide, I forgot what I got. We got 65 when we added 12 to it. 66, then, was slightly outside of that range. That means we would probably tag 66 for further investigation to see if it's representative or if it's anomaly. If it's an anomaly, we're probably going to leave it out and tag it as an outlier. But if there's nothing really wrong with the number, we may go ahead and choose to leave it in the data set. Leaving things in and out of your data set can skew your results greatly than if you had left them in. Therefore, you have to be really careful about calling something an outlier and just excluding it. You have to have a general reason. The numbers themselves aren't necessarily uh, skewed in and of itself just because we get it tagged. We usually have to look at a little bit further uh, and look at how that number got there. Is it something that was a mistake that we made or is it something um, that uh, has a reason behind it, such as a flat tire during a commute or an absence on the day of a test? Make sure that you also read through uh, the book part of this. You'll get a lot more information on that as well, but that is the end of this particular recording. Thank you.